Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today are Jeff Vanderslice and Matt Weibel, Directors of Government Affairs at the Cato Institute. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thanks for having us. What does a Director of Government Affairs do? The main thing is uh, really trying to convey the message uh, that all of Cato's experts uh, produce, um, the great research and commentary and so forth that that you all produce, uh, that it's conveyed to uh, folks in government in an effective way. Uh, That's that's probably the way in which we go about our jobs, uh, which is, you know, being prompt and responsive to folks who reach out to us, but also being proactive, figuring out who exactly needs to hear uh, a particular message uh, that you guys have have, uh, created. Yeah, so we're on we're on Capitol Hill a lot, uh, talking to members of Congress and their staffs about, you know, the newest scholarship that's coming from Cato, um, and we make sure the scholars here know what's happening on Capitol Hill. Um, if there's a health care bill coming up, if there's some other issue coming up, we make sure that that our men and women here know exactly what's going on, so we can be relevant for the policy discussion. So I will dig into what all of that entails and the logistics of how Cato talks to the Hill. But first, how does – what's your background? Like how does someone end up in a role like this? So uh, I worked uh, for Congress for almost a decade total um, but left as deputy chief for Representative Justin Amash from Michigan. And so I was with him for seven and a half years and there's a lot of time researching bills, learning the legislative process, the ins and outs of how that works um, and over – over that decade of, of time, you build relationships on the Hill with staffers who they may have been a staff assistant in 2010, and now they're a legislative director or a chief of staff now. So I think both Jeff and I spent a lot of time on the Hill, and we just know a lot of people. Um, and of course, not everybody stays on the Hill for a long time. So we also know people who were on the Hill and then left and are somewhere else in D.C. So uh, the networking aspect is a huge part of it. And I think also, you know, having worked on the Hill, I, I worked uh, for a little over a decade uh, for a member from California, Congressman Dana Rohrabacher, um, and, and uh, you know, worked my way up through his office and, and uh, left when uh, after I was uh, his chief of staff for, for several years. Uh, I'm sorry, his legislative director for several years. Um, gave myself a promotion that I <laughs> never got. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, being on 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 the Hill, and um, you know, being the recipient of information from organizations like the Cato Institute, you really understand, um, you know, was most effective, what was not quite effective. You know, you, Matt and I probably have, um, you know, various stories of instances in which we reached out to one organization or individual or another, and either got a response that wasn't helpful or was not timely. Um, and so, you know, those are the types of things that I think are, are uh, you know, um, were helpful, um, you know, and, and that we were able to learn on, on, on the Hill. This would be a very general question. and We can sort of get down into it more. But for American people who think Congress is broken and it's full of a bunch of you know, uh, corrupt people who are taking money and not listening to the smart people involved or, and they wonder what what is making Congress act. Like what causes, what drives Congress, would you say? What, and the main thing, if Congress is dealing with something, can you broaden out, like, so they're going to do a health care bill tomorrow, but w- what causes that to happen? Is it because the president wants their health care bill in any given administration? Is it because leadership wants a health care bill? Is it because of news stories all of a sudden come out about a health care bill? And then you have other things that are just not being discussed at all. Uh, no one's doing gun control right now. So what tends to drive Congress's institution overall? So it's partially a, a leadership-driven process. Leadership has an agenda, and we're going to do these things in July. We're going to do this when we come back in September. Right now, it's no secret they're planning on on messaging bills that they want to go into the August recess having passed. So you can go home, have town hall meetings, and tell your constituents, hey, we just did this um, in June and July. We did this right before this, the break. What makes something a messaging bill? Uh, something with a good title, it sounds good, uh, but it doesn't really do anything. And they and they know this. They, I mean, ba- this is not. They know that these bills are basically for that. This is not like, oops, this doesn't do anything. It intentionally does not do anything. Or I would say a messaging messaging bill is something that um, uh, would do something, but has 
zero chance of ever being enacted into law, right? Yeah, and yep. so they they know they they put this forward, they throw that out there just to appeal to you know a particular constituency or something. Yes. So Obamacare is a perfect example. In the 112th, 13th, and 14th Congresses, all of the Republicans voted to repeal it, straight repeal. That vote hasn't come up in the 115th Congress. They voted for it back then because they knew it wouldn't go anywhere. Now they know that with Republicans in control of government that it, it could go somewhere and maybe they don't want it to. Or or before they knew President Obama wouldn't sign something into law, so let's just go home and say, hey, we fought hard to repeal Obamacare, but the president's not going to sign it. Um, but some of the other messaging bills are you know, maybe the, the opioid bills. We're, we're talking about the opioid epidemic. And so there will be a very short bill and give it a good title, you know, Opioid Addiction Awareness Act, and it might be $2 million of grant funding. And so that doesn't really, really do anything, but the congressman can go home and say, hey, I had a bill passed. Um, it has my name on it. I'm Look how effective I am. And leadership can say, look, this is in the news, but we're responding. Now, in that, that would imply that in any given Congress, the first year, what is the difference between the first year and then the election year? Is, is the behavior, is it a very big break where it's like, well, next year we have an election coming up, so if you have 2017, but then 2018, and this happens every two years. So you get it, you get in Congress and you can propose a bunch of things, but then when do you start, when do they start changing modes in that way? Yeah, I think the biggest difference between uh, an off year and an election year is just that an election year tends to be a truncated year, right? Um, if you intend to get anything through the legislative process, it probably needs to happen before the August recess. So, you know, July 31st is kind of a uh, an informal cutoff. Um, after that is kind of a dead uh, zone, you know, you might be able to pass an appropriations bill or more likely just a, a continuing resolution that resolution that uh, continues government funding, you know, through in, uh, through the election and into the lame duck. Um, and then sometimes you can see a flurry of activity again immediately after uh, the election before the new Congress is sworn in. Um, so, you know, I'm sure someone has done research to show exactly, uh, you know, how many pieces of legislation are signed in to law uh, on an odd number in an odd numbered year versus an even numbered year. Um, but I think the, the most obvious thing to, you know, um, um, folks on the Hill is that, uh, you know, you hit the ground running after an election, you have that entire year uh, to, to try and push things through. Uh, going into an election year, you have about seven months uh, and, and, and then things kind of freeze. So in this process when, you know, they, there's legislation that they want to pass, whether it's, I mean, messaging legislation or substantive legislation. How, where do organizations like Cato fit into that? At what point do we come into the process and how do they use the material that we create? I think from uh, at every stage along the way, really. Um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, research produced by an organization uh, like Cato can be a catalyst for legislative change or it can uh, serve to inform members as they go about um, uh, working on a particular issue that's been set in motion by another event, say you know, um, uh, you know, a, a White House um, uh, agenda, um, you know, a State of the Union address, or you know, leadership uh, initiative in, in the House or Senate. Um, so I think, you know, really there are multiple ways and multiple points at which um, uh, you know an organization like Cato can really. Um, you know, um, be beneficial to members. Um, you know, we, we get uh, folks who reach out to us saying, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to propose an amendment to a larger piece of legislation. Have you guys written anything about issue X, right? Um, and if we can send that along uh, to them and they find it useful, um, it, you know, that, that may help them uh, in their thinking as they formulate a, you know, an amendment to, to a larger piece of legislation. Yeah, I'll just echo that and say it definitely happens where at the very beginning of the process, people will contact Jeff or myself and say, what scholarship do you have on this? Um, what do you guys think of this idea for legislation? And then also at the very end of the process, uh, for example, in May, we did a, a Capitol Hill briefing on the Farm Bill, and that was with a couple other groups that we work with on occasion. And it was, hey, the Farm Bill's coming up for a vote next week. Let's break down what's in it, and let's talk about some of the crop subsidies and ways that you could amend it. 
And so that's obviously at the very, very end of the process, but you're trying to make sure staff are aware of you know, what's in the bill. When a member or his or her office reaches out for research, so they've got a bill they want to work on and they want to know if we have research, are they looking for research to inform the what they are going to do or are they looking for research to support what they already want to do? Sometimes both. It'll depend on the member. Um, some will ask for feedback and will just say, you know, what do you have that's in line with, with this? Because it's it's uh, helpful for them when they try to get co-sponsors for a bill to say, hey, uh, the Cato Institute supports these types of policies. This is a good limited government bill, and look what Cato wrote about this sort of policy. In terms of a, we talked about what drives Congress, um, and the, obviously there are 435 or I guess 36, if you include Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, it answers to this, but what it drives the members, or can you kind of I mean, it depends on the member, but do they do they kind of break? Do you ever break them down in the classes, like you know, true warriors of ideology versus people who are just there for the title versus people who have one thing that they care about and they don't really care about anything else versus to wallflowers or something like that. I, I, maybe that's a categorization that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, it's a lot of things that uh, drive members. Um, you know, they all come from you know disparate districts from you know far flung uh, uh, areas of the country. Um, um, who are you know hoping likely to be uh, reelected uh, to Congress? So they're certainly responsive to uh, their constituents as a whole, but also constituencies within their um, uh, you know congressional districts, right? Or or um, you know Senate districts, if it's a you know a, a Senate uh, senator, of course. Um, so I think it's you know it's it's multiple things. I think they a lot of them also have aspirations to uh, you know move up in their respective chambers. So you know there is certainly an element of that uh, of of the job that involves you know pleasing uh, leadership so that you know eventually they can uh, you know become uh, chairman of a committee or ranking member of a committee. Um, you know there are a lot of other organizations you know caucuses like you know there's a you know an ongoing. Uh, um, uh, jockeying to see who will uh, become the next leader of the Republican Study Committee, for instance. There are lots of uh, um, different, uh, you know, groups within Congress that I think members uh, kind of align themselves uh, with, um, you know, in the hopes of gaining more influence within their own, uh, you know, within that very organization. Yeah, I think, you know, it's hard to say this generally, but, you know, some members are driven by status. Right. That's why you see these self-funded politicians who will dump one or two million dollars of their own money into a congressional race just so they can get the title of congressman. I mean, if you're already a millionaire, why do you need to go to Congress? You're, you know, the con congressional salaries are relatively low compared to what they're probably making uh, off the hill. So one one thing, you know, status does drive people and, and they want to be reelected. But there are definitely the true... Uh, warriors out there who are fighting for liberty on an everyday basis, or something else, or or something else. <laughs> yeah, some maybe some of them. Some of them are fighting for universal health care, but they they have an issue that um, is near and dear to their heart, and they spend a lot of time focusing on that one issue. And I would say my observation, and this is a general statement again, that most members. Uh, seem to have a conviction, right? A, a policy conviction, an idea of how the world should look or how, how, how the country should work, uh, uh, look. Um, and, you know, I think that is a major uh, driving force for, for members of Congress. You know, I think there's a lot of cynicism about, oh, well, you know, it's just about status or it's all just about, you know, ego or, uh, you know, an eventual payday once they, you know, join the local lobbying firm or something like that. I, you know, I, um, you know, am not quite that cynical. And of, of course, I think that's a motivating factor uh, to some extent for, for some members. But I, I think uh, m most members, while they're on the Hill, you know, hope and intend to do, uh, uh, you know, something specific uh, policy-wise. And so on that point, because that leads to my next question, which is, and I, I tell students in classes and lectures, I give a bunch where I say that they're not 
bad people, is, you know, libertarians might overplay that hand. So let's assume they're all Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And so he goes to this Mr. Smith, new congressman, never had been in Congress before, goes to Washington, going to clean up this town or do something. I'm going to have a specific agenda. Let's say it's health care. They want to get in. So they come in. And what is their, what is the biggest, you think, rude awakening that, that some new bright-eyed, bushy-tailed member of Congress comes in with Jimmy Jimmy Stewart, I can't say Jimmy Smith, Jimmy Stewart, st- style, st- st- uh, style of thinking. In the first, I feel like in the first couple of months, they might learn something that they didn't know before about how this town and that building actually works. What, what is that rude awakening? You You quickly learn that Washington is very much set in its ways. So I worked for a member who was a freshman at one time, and uh, within the first couple of months, he had walked over to the opposite side of the aisle to talk to his colleagues, and he came back over, and, and an older member who had been around for a while said, what are you doing over there? You know, that's the other side. We don't talk to the other side. And he says, the, my former boss says, this, these are my colleagues. You know, if we're going to get something done, we have to work together. Um, and this isn't to say that the sides don't talk to each other or the parties don't work together, but that was a, a way that was set where it's sort of maybe you're not as friendly with the other side. And I think another thing that is sometimes a rude awakening for for some members is um, a lot of them are, um, you know, fairly um, uh, accomplished in their whatever field they just came from, right? They were either a business owner or a doctor, you know, maybe they uh, had their own law firm, something, right? Um, and they got used to people doing what they told them to do, what, what what they told them to do. Right? They said, "I want um, you know this project completed within the next six months, and if that doesn't happen, you know, you'll be in here explaining to me why that doesn't happen." Well, a member of Congress, you know, will not be all that successful if they say. You know, universal health care has to happen in six months. And staff, it's on your shoulders to make sure that happens um, or else you'll be back in here explaining to me, you know, why why you weren't successful. Um, and, you know, I, I think they very quickly realize that, you know, Congress is, is not a business. It can't run like a business. It won't. Uh, so, you know, acting like a business owner is not going, uh, you know, um, you know, in in a lot of those, you know, uh, same ways is not going to uh, um, result in success. And so, you know, and I, I, I certainly saw that during my time on the Hill, I think. So move their goals down. Well, it's not, it's, I don't know that it's necessarily that. I mean, if, if, you're uh, a business owner, you don't necessarily have an opposing force at your door uh, pushing against everything that you're trying to accomplish, right? Um, and, you know, if, if, if you're um, a member who's trying to um, achieve goal X, guess what? There's at least as many members uh, opposed to the very thing you're trying to accomplish, right? So, yeah, maybe lower your goals. <laughs> Or expectations, rather, not not goals. But what role do donors play in all of this? I mean, from the outside, people think that Congress, you know, that members of Congress are basically the beck and call of whoever contributed to their campaign. And obviously, there are people that contribute to their campaign. But do those do campaign contributors have the ear of members of Congress? Do member are members of Congress reactive to their interests? I think uh, donors definitely have the ear. Um, because they have the access. If you pay a lot of money to go to an event, you expect some face time with the member of Congress. And so that's much more influential maybe than just the average person writing a letter. Um, when you're there with the, per- with the member of Congress talking face to face, you have that issue in their mind. And that's different from saying, hey, boss, we got a thousand letters on health care today. So it definitely they definitely have an influence because you just have the face time that ordinary uh, citizens necessarily wouldn't get. And even uh, at a town hall meeting that's, you know, open forum, a public event, you have a few seconds to ask your question and then the member has to move on to the next question. So there's not the type of discussion um, that a donor w- might be able to have at a, you know, a separate time. I generally um, seem to think that members formulate their their uh, position or their opinion first right? And the money sort of follows after. And there's money to uh, fund whatever point of view a member eventually takes, right? Um, So if you're going to, let's just, you know, say you take a 
pro-business view, again, talking in, a, as, in general terms, take a pro-business view on a particular bill uh, versus an environmental view on the bill. Whatever position you take, there will probably be uh, someone, some organization that will notice and will follow up, you know, uh, you know, with with checks, and and mostly because they want to make sure that that individual gets reelected, right? Um, and so, you know, I think it is probably true that. Um, uh, Members of Congress who receive a donation from an indiv- individual may uh, be more, you know, willing uh, to to um, meet with that individual at a you know later time, um, or you know, um, you know, might be more likely to run into them at an event or something like that. Uh, but but I I generally you know if if you're talking about the chicken egg <laughs> you know kind of thing, I, I I generally think that the positions come first. And then, you know, the money follows from groups that are interested in seeing those members reelected. What's the difference between think tanks like Cato and what we do on the Hill and lobbyists? So lobbyists, they have a specific action that they want Congress to take. You need to pass this uh, this bill because it's good for my client and here's how it will affect them. Um, Cato talks about policy rather than specific legislative action. And we say, okay, here, take this bill. Let's talk about the policy behind it um, and say, you know, this is a good policy for limited government or this, you know, this increases the size and scope of government. Libertarians shouldn't agree with this. So it's more of a, of a philosophical argument that we're trying to make as opposed to you should do this because it's good for my client. They have a factory in your district and it's a thousand jobs and therefore, you know, you have to support it. When between lobbyists and think tanks, it, it has always struck me as interesting that if you take something like the farm bill or another one of these thousand page pieces of legislation that we tend to pass now, and it's full of a, a bunch of things like Obamacare was full of various subsidies and changes to insurance underwriting and all this stuff that I can't imagine that a lot of people who are Hill staffers, g- given the amount of, of stuff in legislation, that, that a given member doesn't have you know someone on staff who knows everything about Section 702 of the SEC code or something that might have been changed in some recent piece of legislation. And there's a paper that came out a, about 10 years ago, I think, uh, a pol- political science science journal article called lobbying as a legislative subsidy and the argument there is that staff is too small to know what government is doing so members of people who work for members of congress and senators have to call someone who knows what is going on when when you're dealing with regulating peanut growers in south, southern georgia which are, that, there's tons of laws trust me i know there are tons of laws that regulate peanut growers in southern georgia but i don't think that there's a specialist on amash's staff who knows about southern peanut growing regulations so how how do how does the staff of members of Congress and senators deal with that information problem there. And maybe Cato can figure in there too, but also maybe lobbyists do. I think um, certainly a lot of members of Congress take kind of a 30,000 foot view of, you know, a particular piece of legislation, right? So they might look at the farm bill and, and say, what's the bottom line? Does this expand the size and scope of the federal government? If it does, given my underlying philosophy, I'm going to oppose it, right? I don't need to know about uh, peanut farmers in, in in Georgia or elsewhere to know that the overall uh, policy is 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 moving in a in the wrong direction, right? So I think that's one way that it can be dealt with, but I think it also um, really illustrates one of the main frustrations of a lot of members of Congress, which is that we, you know, the the House and Senate generally don't vote on small pieces of legislation, one issue at a time, right? They they couple this massive farm bill uh, together, which is not just farm subsidies, right? It's also SNAP, um, um, and they you know they they vote on them together. Um, uh, you know, uh, appropriations bills. Um, you know, they they might get through one chamber, you know, one bill at a time. Uh, but at the end of the day, when when uh, when the you know whatever is going to be signed into law, usually it's packaged together with several other bills, and it's passed as either what what, what they call a minibus or or a megabus, which is you know usually all all of the uh, appropriations bills or a, or a, or an omnibus, um, and you know so I, I you know I, I I've always thought that. If 
and I think a lot of other members would, would prefer to see this too, is that if you broke things down uh, into smaller pieces, you could actually achieve uh, m m um, much greater uh, policy uh, advancements, right? Um, I think the art of, of legislating in, um, in large part is, has everything to do with building and maintaining coalitions, right? Um, you know, we're probably not anytime soon going to see 218 uh, libertarians in the House of Representatives or 51 uh, libertarians in the Senate uh, at the same time that there's a libertarian in the White House, right? But if you take uh, an issue like uh, one that I worked on, which was um, marijuana policy, you know, we had a legislative success using a coalition of uh, libertarian-minded uh, Republicans, moderate Republicans, and a whole lot of Democrats who came together and said, yes, on, on medical marijuana, we should not be, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, basically uh, sending the DOJ to lock up people who are acting in compliance with their state laws, right? And so that's really a libertarian position. Does that mean that everybody who, who, um, who, who, who voted for this uh, ascribes to all of the other, uh, you know, uh, uh, tenets of libertarian philosophy? Certainly not. Um, but if, if you vote on things... Um, um, uh, you know, in a piecemeal enough fashion, I think there's a chance to, you know, really tackle some of these bigger issues. And to address the underlying question about the knowledge that lobbyists have, yes, they know more generally about a, their specific issue than your average congressional staffer and certainly more than the member of Congress. And so this is an argument people make of why we shouldn't have term limits, because if you have term limits, you have a new member come in, you have new staff. They're constantly turning over. You have no expertise on the process of how the House or the Senate are supposed to work or on the issues. So the lobbyists come in and they say, hey, we already have a white paper for you on this issue, and this is why it's good or bad. Um, so that's that's one thing that people will do when they, when they argue against term limits is that um, we need the staff expertise and the members need to be around for a while to, to learn the process so it's not outsourced, so to speak, to lobbyists. How much does it matter on this question of the huge bills? Um, they bring them all together and they say, okay, Republicans are going to vote on this. I don't know if they, if like Paul Ryan or the speaker sends out an email that says, this, we've decided the party is going to vote on this. They or all something. go put their hands on the orb. They, yeah, they all go put their hands on the orb and say, yay, Republicans, yay, whatever. But how much does being a team player matter in you're standing in Congress. If you're, if you constantly come in and say, "No, I'm not going to vote on that," because it, there's you know three lines in the in this omnibus farm bill, but I'm I'm here to, to protest the size and scope of government. So you're some sort of, sort of a gadfly in the entire process. And then was that would that hurt you in the sort of you know in the in the Republican side of the cafeteria and Congress will no one sit with you and therefore no one will sponsor your bills and therefore no one will return your phone calls is that another dynamic that goes on in Congress I think it is a dynamic um, I heard fairly early on uh, in my time on the hill that it uh, that that someone from um, uh, one of the party's leaderships uh, early early on uh, expressed to uh, a new member who said, you know, it's okay if you vote against us, but don't ever surprise us, right? And so, you know, I think there are varying levels of of you know what's acceptable, right? And so if you um, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, oppose a measure on the floor, you know, that's not the same as first telling the whip, yeah, I'm with you, and then voting against it for obvious reasons. But, right, th there, there's there's definitely, I think, a, a, um, a, a, a culture in which, you know, leadership, you know, generally respects where members are coming from. They understand that they, you know, have their reelection prospects in mind that, you know, a lot of members should be free to a certain extent to, to vote however they need. Um, but the way in which you conduct yourself as you oppose, uh, you know, um, measures that leadership brings to the floor, I think, uh, matters quite a bit to, to the leadership. And I think the general rank and file membership wants you to be a team player because they want to say, we know how to govern. We can get things passed. This is why you should vote for our party. And when you're not a team player, there certainly can be consequences. It's one thing if leadership understands where you're coming from, and they have the, but they have the numbers to pass something. It's something else when you're in committee 
for example, and this happened with my boss, he and another member, my former boss, he and another member voted against the budget and the budget committee. And, you know, Republicans were supposed to be able to pass this easily out of committee. Well, it was a terrible budget in our minds. You know, it didn't reach balance in 10 years. And even some of the worst budgets will somehow reach balance in 10 years because they estimate, you know, huge economic growth or whatever. But, you know, a couple weeks later, he and another member were kicked off the budget committee. So there are there are consequences to not being a team player where you'll lose a, a prime committee assignment or um, maybe you do have to sit on the other side of the cafeteria or maybe when it comes to a primary challenge, your colleagues don't support you and maybe they don't actively help the challenger, but they don't step in to, you know, support maybe somebody in the same delegation or, you know, from the same region. So these bills that they're t- discussing in committee are eventually um, voting on on the floor. Who who writes those? Who's writing the actual legislation that might become law? So technically, House Legislative Council writes the bill. So this is a group of lawyers that work for the House where a member or staffer can go to these lawyers and say, hey, we have an idea for a bill. This is what we want it to accomplish. That's one way to do it. Uh, the other way to do it is to you know have a lawyer on staff or have your staffer review the law and try to write it or at least an outline for 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 themselves um which i think is a better way of doing it at least to start so that that way you're doing some work and you have some some hand in the process and a, another way is where lobbyists come in and they have the bill drafted for you they know exactly what they want changed in law uh or maybe it's a trade association not necessarily a lobbyist but a special interest where they know what section of law is affecting them and they come to your door and they say, hey, we think you should do this and here's legislative text, here's what it would look like because we have lawyers in our corporation or our trade association or our lobbying firm that know exactly what needs to be changed. So that would be, I mean, the question, a member of Congress, I'm again thinking about like the first week of someone just getting to the Hill and and because there's like an orientation, isn't there, for new members of Congress? There is a like, member orientation. I think it's two weeks after the election. The election. Because yeah. it's, you know, you, you don't necessarily know how to be a member of Congress because you won an election. You may have, you have no idea. And all the rules here, but he says, I want to legalize marijuana. So he says, okay, Jeff, get on that. Uh, come, you know, You're working for a new member. I want to write a bill to legalize marijuana. And if you look at the bill, there's all these bills always just floating around that that already do that too, right? That's, I mean, there's a ton. I don't even know, know how many on just descheduling marijuana are out there, but and they've been sitting around forever, but nothing ever happens. Is there, so, do you first go look and see if there's an existing bill, or what, what, what would the process be with the, the new member in that situation? Yeah, the process would usually, uh, you know, I, I think. Uh, most folks at Legislative Council, the organization that uh, Matt just referenced, pr- would prefer that uh, y- you do some of your research first, right? So y- y- your your first step might be going to the Congressional Research Service and asking them that very question. Has anybody attempted to do that? Can you give us, you know, um, uh, examples of past legislation that's been introduced on this topic? And, you know, there are also a lot of t- attorneys at CRS who could say, you know, this is the... It, precisely the section of law that you want to amend. Um, and here are some things that you should take into consideration um, uh, when talking to legislative council, right? And then your next uh, you know, uh, message may be to legislative council with the information that you've gathered um, and, and asking them to uh, draft a piece of legislation. And, and, and a lot of times it's a, a back and forth process, right? You get a draft back. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, they... they put in the header, you know, discussion draft. And, and uh, you know, they have a lot of blanks depending on what exactly you're trying to accomplish. And you can, uh, you know, have discussions with other staff, uh, sometimes with, with committee staff, uh, if they might be inclined to help you with, with a, a piece of legislation. Um, you know, you might take it back to CRS and say, you know, what specifically would be the policy implications of taking approach A versus approach B in this in this uh, space um, and and going from there yeah we see a lot of theatrics in Congress so we we just last week was it had the hearing with the FBI agent um, where members were holding up signs and it's um, a lot of it feels 
pretty over the top um, and some, and frequently looks kind of silly. Um, do do members of Congress how earnest are they in their theatrics? Like, do they are they play acting? Um, do they know like do they know how ridiculous this can look? Do they not know? Um, it just it's hard. It sometimes is hard when they're like they're really getting into this to look at this and be like, this person is this person serious? I think a lot of it is for show, and that doesn't mean that there aren't members passionate about an issue who really would get fired up in a committee hearing. But what you see that you can say, wow, that's over the top, it happens on a regular basis, even if you don't think it's over the top, where you know the member could be arguing with – a Republican could be arguing with a Democrat, and then after the hearing, they can go laugh about it. And I'm not going to say that they would say, oh, yeah, this was a great show that we put on. But they, generally speaking, it's my impression that you want the media hit. You want to be on the news for a few minutes because it looks like you're really passionate about something, and, and maybe you are, um, and it looks like you're doing your job. You're there. You're, you're causing a fuss. You're, you're asking this government agency why they spent money improperly or um, that sort of thing. But it's it does wear on you as a staffer because, you know, you see – or it wore on me as a staffer because I saw members who um, would always put on the show and it was just for the sake of the show. Well, getting that media hit is incredibly important. I always I always think it's amazing that, you know, I work here, I don't do what, I, I work in D.C., but I don't do what you guys do with government affairs. But I don't think, I mean, even if you're really informed about Congress, it would be hard to name more than 100 members of Congress off the top of How your head. How many can you guys name off the top can of you, your head? The, the, we're we're going to start this right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We'll we got about, we got about like, 20 minutes like left. So. But like 100, I mean, if even people are really informed, would, like 100 would be a lot. Uh, and there's still 335 that you're missing uh, who would love to be one of the names you remember. Right. And one of the names you remember maybe come from getting a good histrionic media hit or thinking that Guam will capsize uh, as Johnson famously believed at one point. So it is. It is interesting. Now, these committees you, you mentioned, um, when, they're not. They're not. They're just part of the tradition. They're not in the Constitution or anything. But they have these committees that, co that Congress delegates certain responsibilities to. And then, how do you become members of various committees? You get assigned committees when you get there. Correct. If you're a member of Congress initially. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> so leadership generally asks members what their committee preferences are. Um, and from, what's the what's the one no one wants to be on? What's like? Is there like a real black small sheep business or uh, house administration? House administration, yeah. okay, okay. which is very powerful in D.C., <laughs> but not outside of. So if you so if you really make people mad, you find yourself transferred to house administration. Or is something everyone like that. on a committee? Uh, yes, I am. There I have been so. instances in the past where, again, because you're punished, members haven't had any committee assignments, but they're they moving to the broom closet. Your, your, your office is now the broom closet. That's and right. Yeah, okay. But otherwise, yes. But otherwise, yes, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so basically, yeah, you, 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 um, you know, leadership gives you a list, a list asks you to rank, you know, your top, let's say, five preferences uh, for committee assignments. I think it's a combination of that, what your background is, what you have to add to a particular committee. I think there is probably some internal selection so that they don't stack, um, you know, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a particular committee with, uh, you know, let's say the agriculture committee with too many people who are skeptical of, of, of agriculture subsidies, right? Uh, they may be uh, reticent to, um, uh, you know, do that. Uh, but otherwise, um, I, I, you know, it's kind of a play between leadership's preferences and, and the members' preferences. Um, you know, there are certain committee assignments that play better uh, back home than others, right? So if if you represent a major military base, um, uh, you know, y you as a member may want to be on the Armed Services Committee um, and leadership may also want to give you Armed Services Committee because that's going to bode well for uh, your election, re-election prospects, um, you know, your, your knowledge and, uh, you know, ability to affect change on that committee and so forth, yeah. Not becoming like a chair or a ranking member of that you have to put in your your time for that, correct? And if you and if you do become a chair of a at least especially a, a very prominent committee, that really helps with your fundraising and, and electoral prospects, correct? Absolutely. I mean, a chair of of the committee is extremely powerful. You you control what legislation your committee passes, 
um, for the most part. There are times when leadership has asked committees, hey, we need you to bring this bill through the committee because we want it to go through the normal process, so please have a markup. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's basically at the discretion of the chair uh, what comes through the committee. And, um, you know, that's a, a position that you have to work up to. And maybe it's just because you're an expert on an issue. You know, it matters how much money you raise for the party uh, and how much of a team player you are. That that definitely is an aspect. Um, but, yeah, it, it takes time uh, to get to get to the top of a committee. What's the difference between a committee and a caucus? A committee is a formally um, uh, recognized uh, organization, essentially within uh, the, the the you know the House or the Senate, right? So a committee is uh, created um, through you know a, a, a procedure through you know a House resolution or a Senate resolution. It's a formal entity that has a designated budget, designated staff, and so forth. Uh, a caucus is uh, much more informal, uh, generally speaking, with the exception of the Senate Narcotics um, uh, Caucus or Cau- Senate Caucus on Narcotics, whatever the name is. Um, there, uh, you know that that has uh, essentially the same status as a committee but but what most people think of as uh, caucuses it's just a group of members who have a common interest that band together and say we're going to try and elevate this particular policy uh, issue and our um, standing as it relates to this issue through the formation of this caucus now, when did so? When did you get to DC, Jeff? Originally, I came uh, in 2006 originally uh, to intern, and then came back in 2007 to begin working full time. And Matt, I started my internships in 2008, and then went full time in 2010. So you guys have seen some interesting beginning of the Obama years. That first two years, 2008 to 2010, which was pretty contentious and a lot of well, Rahm Emanuel, we have the votes, f em kind of attitude. Uh, and now we have, of course, Trump, and we have the, the latter half of the Obama years. Um, has anything significantly changed? I mean, in the way that Congress is behaving, or have you seen much? And do you is it, do you put it to partisanship? If if so, do you put it to the d- divided nation, to Obama people? How much Republicans hated Obama? To what Obama did to force Affordable Care Act through and the Tea Party movement? Any maybe or something else? There have been some changes. With I think the most notable change that I've seen is when we had a Republican, you know, take the White House, because uh, like I said earlier. You could pass something in the House and say that you voted for it and campaign on it, and you knew there was no danger of the, or hope of the president actually signing it. Uh, people could rail against military action overseas because President Obama didn't have the authority to do it. But now that President Trump is doing it and he's a Republican, you hear crickets. Um, so that's, that's one of the biggest things I noticed is maybe a lack of consistency or, or the true partisan nature of D.C. where the letter after your name really uh, determines whether you oppose something or support something. So that has become clear, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, even from uh, 2011, when, when Speaker Boehner took the speakership, the, the House process opened up more than it had been in the past. You know, members were allowed to offer amendments, and that's been scaled back significantly um, over the years. But at first there was this, this desire to let op- uh, members offer amendments and let the House vote on it. You know, let's let's not t- control the process and prevent people from taking tough votes. We should actually debate and vote on these things. And in spirit, it was there. And I think February of 2010, whenever they did an appropriations bill, H.R. 1, you know, they did hundreds of amendments late into the night. And I think that was the most open of a process that I had seen. And it's, it's scaled back, but it's... Um, I just have to clarify this. This is this is just House rules. They say that members can't offer amendments or something like this, right? So, but if this was, I'm thinking, it's a constitutional scholar. If you're sitting on the floor of the House and we were in 1792 and James Madison wanted to stand up and said, I'd like to offer an amendment and someone else tried to say, you're not allowed to offer an amendment, um, that none of that is in the Constitution. Like, you could then, no, I'd like to take a vote about who, who's, whether or not we can amend this piece of legislation. And that's how it worked in the early 1790s. What, what does it mean to say, you, Mr. Mr. Amash, cannot 
bring this amendment? How, is it just the speaker using his power and the House rules? And is that where it comes from? It's yeah. And on the House side, it's the uh, House Rules Committee, which makes those determin- determinations on a case by case basis. Right. So it's not a, uh, a standing rule of the House that no amendments will be allowed. Uh, each individual bill that comes forward um, uh, generally with the exception of uh, bills considered under suspension of the rules, which we can set aside, uh, only talk about those that are considered under a uh, House rule, uh, those bills have a rule accompanying uh, each piece of legislation uh, that's considered on the House floor um, that, that and, and the rule basically uh, determines the uh, nature of the debate, right? It, it, it outlines um, how long uh, debate should last for, uh, who uh, will control time during uh, general debate, and what amendments are made in order, um, in what order those amendments should be made in order, and who will be recognized uh, to offer those amendments. Um, so, you know, as a as a Hill staffer, if you want to, uh, if your um, you know boss wants to offer an amendment, basically you submit those to the Rules Committee, and then you plead to the Rules Committee to make that amendment in order, and hope that you know the chairman and the members of the committee will will uh, make a decision in your favor, right? And the Constitution, you know, allows room for the House and the Senate to set their own rules. So there's there's that argument that. They pass a rules package at the beginning of each Congress, and then the House Rules Committee, which is established in the rules package, will then set the time and, and debate process for each bill. So there is flexibility there, uh, though sometimes you know, that flexibility can be annoying because your amendments don't get voted on and the process can be closed down. We've got a lot of movies and TV shows about Congress and government and Washington. Um, many of them very popular. What do what's the biggest thing that you know? Say you're watching House of Cards, or you're sitting through episodes of The West Wing, or whatever that these shows get wrong about Congress. And what's the biggest thing they get right? I always say the I always say the the Veep is the biggest, the best documentary about DC ever in terms of the personalities involved. Well, what they get right is that it is very fast-paced and hectic. When you're in session, things are moving quickly, and you could be focusing your time on one topic and then quickly on another topic, and then some crisis is happening over here. Um, I'm thinking more of the West Wing. Yeah, there's I think a lot of, of walking and talking. Kind yeah, of going exactly. On. Yeah. And uh, even you know when you're talking to your boss about how to vote on a bill, you might have two minutes to to really fully brief the member. And that's as you're walking to the floor and you're trying to dodge reporters and, and get into the House chamber. And But you have to have this conversation on the way because the schedules are just very hectic by nature. So that is one thing that they get right is that it is very, very busy, very hectic, long hours for sure. And maybe something they uh, don't exactly have on point is that um, – Every day is not quite quite as uh, as exciting, obviously, as as you know, maybe an episode of of the West Wing or of Veep or House of Cards or something like that. Yeah, there there are some. Well, then they're out of session, or they're of they're, course, yeah, a lot of different right. things. Is there? I mean, the thing that these the thing these shows always show is like intrigue and backstabbing, like, and so I I mean I get that members disagree and all that, but is it as is it as Game of Thrones intrigue laden as these shows make it out to be, or is it? You mentioned that I mean they can they can go and have a drink together after having a big argument on the hill, but do you get those kinds of factions and infighting as much as we seem to think we do? I don't think it's functional enough to be that um, <laughs> deliberate about it that you could be Game of Thrones style. I think I might still be there if it, if it were because. Uh, um, that's one reason why you left is that it wasn't functional. Enough. Yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah. Well, okay. That, that on that point, and is Congress broken? Is in some way that a lot of people have said this as the approval rating of uh, you know I think Ava Braun. I mean it's it's below ten percent, um, and it doesn't seem to be able to get stuff done. And now there's always political nostalgia where someone can say, back in my day, Congress got stuff done and, you know, passed Medicaid and Medicare and everything. But, you know, for long periods of time in history, Congress has been divided in different ways. Uh, but is there something different about now? Or maybe maybe it's just game as usual that this is how 
this is how governing works. I think this is how governing works. I don't think Congress is broken. Right, The framers set up the House and Senate differently, but they set up the legislative process to be slow and deliberate. The Senate was designed you know, to, get, to give the states a voice and to be the less reactionary body. And it's proof, you know, when you see these mass shootings or, you know, incidents or um, anything in the news that the House is is naturally the very reactionary body because of the two-year term limits. It's the body that's closest to the people because they, by their nature, except for the states that have only one member, um, represent less people than, than what the Senate will do. So I think a slower legislative process is better, and I often think you're not getting anything done, well, yeah, we need to get some things done, but let's make sure we do it the right way. And I don't think they're necessarily saying the same thing I'm saying, but I prefer a slower, more deliberative, let's not be so reactionary, let's not do the knee-jerk reaction and pass a bill, you know, um, requiring some sort of adding, you know, this was the Fix Nix Act where they added, you know, wanted to add thousands of names to the... um, you know, firearms database where, and we've seen this with the do not fly list, where people with the same name, you'd be put on the wrong list. And you were, you weren't told why you're on the do not fly list. And it's very difficult to get off. So um, knee jerk reactions, they might look good. Oh, Congress did something to, to solve this issue. Um, when it comes to legislation, it has to be done done very carefully. I also think that it's easy to beat up on Congress um, because it often does seem dysfunctional, right? Different people are saying different things. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any unified message, unlike you know the the, the presidency, right? Uh, generally speaking, they speak with one voice. Sometimes you get some <laughs> dissenting voices, right? Um, uh, you know, the Supreme Court generally the same way, right? Um, uh, or courts, um, uh, you know, um, generally, you know, have an opinion. Of course, there might be, uh, you know, dissents or concurring opinions and so forth, but but there aren't just the sheer number uh, of, of uh, voices, right? And so, um, I mean, n- not only is it more difficult, actually more difficult to uh, reach consensus in uh, in in you know in Congress, um, but you know it also appears that way, right? It's obvious that that you know folks are on different pages. I remember going home once and someone came up to me uh, and said, you know, why can't the two sides just get together and and agree, right? And he said, I'm a lawyer, and whenever I have a client who has an opposing point of view, I sit down with their lawyer, and um, or, or you know the the two sides sit down together and we basically meet in the middle, and that's the solution, right? Well, you don't have just two sides in. Congress. You have two sides plus this faction and, you know, also this faction and also this faction. You know, there could be as many as we discussed earlier, 435 in the House and, you know, 100 in the Senate and so forth. So, um, you know, it is it is very chaotic. It's, it is very messy. Um, but I don't know, you know, certainly there are issues, um, you know, with you know, any number of of areas, right? Some people talk about the budgetary process, you know, that needs to be reformed and so forth. But I don't think that means that the institution itself is broken. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.